Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's tuning in, hoping you're doing well and staying safe. On behalf of Pio Petro, Arab Oil and Gas Academy, SPE Egypt section, I'd like to welcome you all for today's session. My name is Mayar Tare. I'm a third year gas and petrochemical engineer at Alexandria University, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Before we start, please, I'd like to remind you to drop your questions in the Q&A section below. Please keep the chat box professional and ethical. And most importantly, submit your quizzes before the deadline. Now, let us give a warm welcome to Professor Chris Jacobs, who will be giving us a session in gas chromatography and measuring dew point. Professor Chris is an adjunct, adjunct professor at Marita College and is a professional engineer. Professor Chris has been teaching since 2004 and is primarily involved with teaching the petroleum lab courses such as core lab, drilling, and natural gas. He also teach, teaches Marita College's Fundamentals of Engineering Review course. Professor Chris has extensive knowledge in, in, in energy systems, specifically solar photovoltaics. Professor Chris, thank you so much for coming today and the mic is yours. Well, thank you for having me and I appreciate that good introduction. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. So as, as you can see, we're gonna talk about two different topics today, although they are related. So let's, we'll move right into it. So the first thing that I'll ask is, so what's, what's the, uh, why do we want to know what the dew point is? Why is that even a problem? Well, I have at least four things listed, or four things that are listed here. So and obviously hydrates and water blockages are production issues, internal corrosion and section loss, that could be a health and safety issue. Another very important thing that's not on this list is decreased value. You know, so if we have, if we have water vapor in our gas, that increases the volume and it decreases the heating value. And most gas is sold based on heating value. So let's say we have an example of a, of a gas stream that's at 80% methane as, as a dry gas. If we start mixing extra moisture into that, for that same cubic foot of gas, now we don't exactly have 80% methane. We'd be down to 70% methane because the water is taking up some volume. Another big thing here is natural gas containing liquid water is corrosive, which gets back to the internal corrosion issue. And finally, the last bullet point here, and this is very important, is you cannot design your dehydration system until you know what the dew point is. Otherwise, you're trying to, you're trying to guess how much water is in there, and the design of the dehydration system depends on the actual the volume of water. So what exactly are gas hydrates? So here's a picture of a gas hydrate in a pipeline. It's a naturally occurring ice-like substance. It's combining natural gas and water. And obviously, something like this, you can see it blocks pipelines and processing equipment. Now, hydrates are a physical combination of water and gas. Now, here's the caveat. They're formed at pressures and temperatures well above the freezing point of water. So while this looks like it's a block of ice, it may not be at zero degrees Celsius. It's probably higher than that. But these physical combinations are formed when gas is in the presence of fresh water or liquid water at or below the hydrate temperature. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the hydrate temperature is not the same as the condensation temperature of water vapor or the dew point temperature. Okay, so these are not actually condensing into this. Now, the condensed water, however, will lead to the free water that is available or needed for hydrate formation. So just because it's not condensation of water, this is not caused by the condensation of water, doesn't mean we don't need to worry about the condensation of water. One of the primary conditions that promotes hydrate formation is when gas is at or below its dew point temperature with the free water present. So I mentioned the free water is an important, important thing to have. If you have free water, you're likely to get hydrates. Now, obviously, there are a couple of operating conditions that will, will create hydrates like this. Uh, number one is if you're uh, piping your gas at a constant temperature or constant pressure, rather, and you have a sudden decrease in temperature, that can cause hydrate formation. And if you have a sudden expansion of a gas flow through a flow restriction, that can also cause hydrate formation. So now hydrate formation at constant pressure with a sudden decrease in temperature can actually be estimated using pressure versus temperature graphs if you know the pressure and the specific gravity. 
So here's another example of why specific gravity is important to know. And this sort of follows in with the lecture I did the last time about specific gravity. One way to prevent hydrates is by heating cold, unprocessed well stream gas or, or raw gas directly from the wellhead. So if you heat it up, that can cause a change and pre prevent some hydrate formations. Because what happens is if the pressure and water content are constant during heating, the gas becomes undersaturated. So we're talking about gas saturation here with water. And as we get into the dew point, you'll understand why that's important. Now here's another picture of hydrates, and maybe you've seen this and maybe you haven't, but it's interesting to know that you actually can burn a hydrate. You say, well, it looks like an ice cube. Well, it's not exactly an ice cube because the large, there's large amounts of methane trapped within the crystalline structure of the water. So the hydrates have void spaces in the center, which is where the methane is. So as the methane starts to release, it burns, and then the heat melts some more of the, the outside of the hydrate. And you, so it's kind of interesting to see you can actually burn hydrates. They're called flammable ice. So now we're going to start talking about the dew point. And what exactly are we talking about when we say dew point? Well, obviously, you can see here it's the temperature at which water vapor begins to condense at a given pressure. Well, that sounds very textbook, and it is. But when you have a gas-water vapor mixture is cooled out of contact, basically with the liquid water, the absolute humidity remains the same. So if we take a certain volume of water, and this is true if you look at it in terms of the summertime, the air can hold a lot more water vapor than it can in the wintertime. So the absolute humidity is the total amount of water content you have. Now the relative humidity is the percentage saturation of that water vapor. <clears throat> so when the percentage reaches 100% saturation, that's when you start having condens condensation and that's what the dew point is. So if you think about it like a sponge, like when you're, if you're move, uh, mopping up your table, for example, and the sponge is completely full of water, once you pick the sponge up, it's, it's, it won't hold any more water. And as you pick it up, all the extra water is just going to dr dribble right off of there. Once you start to squeeze out some of the water from the sponge, now you've reduced some of that volume of water. Now the sponge can, in turn, absorb more water. Now, one way that we can consistently measure the dew point is using this Bureau of Mines dew point tester which was originally developed in the 1930s. And it works under the principle because it duplicates the conditions required by the definition of the dew point. In other words, it cools the gas vapor mixture to 100% relative humidity. And at that point, the gas can no longer hold any more moisture vapor, water vapor, and it will condense out. And, that's, and we can determine the dew point based on that. So this is an example of what the Bureau of Mines dew point tester looks like. So if you look at what we have over here, this is a line drawing, and these are both exactly the same thing. The most important part is this pressure tight chamber here. Okay, there's a pressure tight chamber, and it's this, it's this area right in here. <clears throat> now, we, obviously, we're gonna have an inlet and outlet valve to control the flow of gas. On this particular one on the right here, the inlet valve is on the bottom, and this is the outlet valve. So over here, you can see here, we've got the inlet and we've got the outlet. There's a plastic window right at the very end here, you can't see, and it was just basically right about in this location here. And, the, and once you get to this pressure tight chamber, there's a highly polished mirror on the inside, and this is where the condensation actually occurs. So here's where the mirror would look like on this line diagram over here. <clears throat> you will notice that there is a thermometer well attached to the other side of the mirror. Here you can see the end of the thermometer. Here's the mirror, okay. We have a chiller, which is this cylindrical item here that we use to cool this thermometer well. And we're actually gonna use liquid carbon dioxide as a refrigerant. So you may be wondering, how does liquid carbon dioxide work as a refrigerant? When liquid carbon dioxide is released from our storage tank, the expansion of the liquid and the high speed evaporation causes a significant temperature drop inside this thermometer well here. So the temperature could drop very quickly. Now liquid CO2 can actually be used to determine dew points as low as zero degrees Fahrenheit minus 17 Celsius. So unless we're talking about gases really, really cold, we can use liquid carbon dioxide. It's fairly inexpensive, it's widely available and generally environmentally safe. 
<clears throat> now, as I mentioned, you have this uh, thermometer in here that measures the temperature of this mirror. So we're going to we're going to use we're going to look inside and we're going to see something happening on this mirror and we're going to be able to determine the exact temperature of that mirror. Now the the thing is, well, how are we going to look inside to determine this? Whether there's any ha anything happen on the polish mirror? We have this observation mirror over here. So a lot of times you'll be reading in the literature, you need to look at the mirror and then look at the thermometer and go back and forth. Well, the mirror you need to look at is the one that's in here, but since you can't look directly in the end you use this observation mirror. Now, one thing that's important when you're using this Bureau of Mines dew point tester is that you use metal tubing to attach to the inlet and outlet valve. If you use a hose, you could allow water vapor to be removed or added to the gas sample, in which case you're gonna get an inaccurate reading of the dew point. Now, you may be thinking, well, so if water's removed, that's, be that's better. So if, if I'm using a hose and the hose allows water to be removed from the gas stream because of the porousness of the hose, you think that's a good idea. Well, the problem is if you're gonna design your dehydration system and you design it based on a dew point that is lower or higher than you want, you're still gonna get the wrong value and it's gonna influence the dehydration system and it will be under-designed. Now, as you can see, this is actually a portable unit here. There's no electronics on this at all. This is on a tripod. So you can basically just take it apart, take it out in the field. You just unscrew your thermometer, you put that in a case because this is a glass thermometer and you can take it out in the field. Very simple to use, doesn't require any power. Now, obviously when you're out in the field, you wanna use a representative sample and you wanna try and keep the temperature of the sampling line and the temperature of the tester above the temperature of the gas in the pipeline, okay? And it goes without saying that you want the sampling line not to have any condensed water in it. This pressure gauge over here is what you're gonna to use to determine what pressure the dew point temperature is at. So obviously you shouldn't notice a pressure drop between where you tap into the pipeline and the dew point tester itself. Okay, so how exactly are we gonna use this? What's the, what's the procedure here? Well, the big thing is, you always wanna make sure the thing is purged. Now I do have a demonstration video that I'm gonna show you. So you don't have to, to actually hear me talk about it. Maybe a little difficult to understand, but just kind of follow along with me and I'll show you the demonstration video of how we actually do it. So obviously normally in that pressure tight chamber, in this pressure tight chamber here, normally you're gonna have air in here just, just from moving it around. So obviously you wanna purge your air out first and then you connect your gas sample and your carbon dioxide. Now we use the inlet valve always has to be open fully. Okay, we want, we're gonna adjust the flow rate with the outlet valve. And why do we do that? Well, because we want the throttling effect to occur downstream of the dew point tester. We don't wanna have the pressure change because we throttled the gas flow before it got into the dew point tester. So usually we adjust the flow rate to 0 0.05 to 0 0.5 standard cubic feet per minute. Okay, and if we're testing air, which is the demonstration I do, we set it to about 105 PSIG. Now, we have to introduce the refrigerant to that temperature well. And rather than just open the valve and just let the temperature, the gas, CO2 gas flow through and cool that temperature down, we, we throttle it or we crack it. We open it for a second or two. And the reason is because the response time of the thermometer is a little bit slower than the cooling temperature is. And secondly, because carbon dioxide cools so quickly, if we just introduce the carbon dioxide in a continuous stream, we'll shoot from, let's say, air temperature at 20 degrees Celsius down to minus five in maybe 10 seconds. So we've overshot the dew point, okay? However, we can use this fast cooling effect to our advantage. If we do not know the dew point, we can cool the temperature down fairly quickly watch for water to form on the mirror, and then we'll know approximately what the dew point temperature is. So now we've gotten the temperature down of the chamber to just say slightly above the dew point. So now we're going to simultaneously observe the mirror and the thermometer. So going back to this picture over here, so you're gonna be looking at this mirror and then you're gonna be looking at the thermometer. Look at this mirror and the thermometer. Now you, you can spend most of your time focusing on this mirror. And as soon as you start to see condensation form inside the unit, then you can look at the 
thermometer, but you need to be paying attention to both. When we first start to see droplets of water appear on the mirror, that's condensation. The water is condensing on the mirror. Sort of like when you take a shower and you see the water condensing on your mirror, same, same basic principle. Now you're gonna note the temperature that that happens. That is the dew point at that specific pressure. Okay, now we've only got half the story here. Now we wanna take and we wanna warm the chamber a few degrees above the dew point temperature and note the temperature when the last drop of moisture appears from the mirror. So you're gonna let it condense on the mirror, not completely, you don't want the mirror to be completely covered with condensation, but you can see it to start to condense on the mirror. You're gonna let the chamber warm back up again. And as the temperature starts to exceed the dew point, the, the water vapor on the mirror will start to disappear. And you wanna repeat this two or three times and take an average of those six temperatures or four if you did it twice, and that's your dew point. And then you wanna repeat the, the process for several different pressure chambers, okay? And importantly to know, you make sure you wanna test, make sure, do this test at operating conditions. You don't wanna test this in a lab at say, for example, 20 degrees Celsius and 100 PSI if you're gonna be running at your, your tank at 10 degrees Celsius and 50 PSI. So you always wanna make sure you're testing at the correct temperature and pressure of the pipeline. So here's a tip, and I mentioned this briefly before, don't reduce the temperature too quickly, you're gonna overshoot the dew point. And when, as you're first getting used to this, it takes some time to do this. So you may overshoot it a few times. Once you know what you're looking for, you'll know when you're shooting, going down too quickly. The recovery time, the colder you make it, the farther you go past the dew point, it could take 15 to 20 seconds. It could take a minute or two minutes to recover. So if you're trying to do things in a short period of time, you're farther ahead to just lower the temperature slowly until you get what you want here, okay? And I mentioned you can, you can quickly drop the temperature and watch the condensation appear on the mirror to get an estimate of the dew point temperature. But then you have to go back and you have to you know, crack that valve or throttle that valve so you're getting the correct temperature. Now, I'm gonna show you a video of, of what we're looking at over here, okay? This is a video of how it actually works. So this is the Bureau of Mines dew point tester that we talked about earlier. The carbon dioxide tank that we are using as our refrigerant is down here. This is the chamber that I mentioned where the gas is actually gonna flow through the inside of this chamber. This is the outlet valve. This over here is the observation mirror. This is how we're going to determine if there is condensation on the chamber mirror, which is inside the chamber. And again, this is our thermometer. So what I will do, the first thing I will do is I will open up the inlet valve fully, which I've already done, and I will adjust the flow rate with the outlet valve here. So once I have air or natural gas flowing through the unit, then I will very slowly just crack open this valve or throttle it so I let a little bit of CO2 out to cool this chamber down. And as you can hear just a little bit of a puff, because you want it to cool the chamber down slowly, otherwise you overshoot the dew point. And at the same time I'm opening the chamber, I'll be looking at the, in this mirror to look at the, the chamber mirror, and then I'll be looking at the temperature. So once I start to see the first droplets form on the chamber mirror, then I will note the temperature. Okay, I pre-chilled it before, so I didn't have to go down from room temperature. And now I just saw some droplets form. I look over at the temperature. It is 62 degrees. Now what I will do is I will leave the carbon dioxide off and let it warm back up again. And I will note the second time, the second temperature, when the final droplets disappear from the chamber mirror. And I will take the average of those two temperatures, which will give me my initial dew point. So the second, second droplets are gone, the temperature is now 60 degrees. So now what I'll do is I'll let it warm up a little more and then I will do it again. Okay, I just started seeing droplets and the temperature is 58 degrees. So again, I will shut it off 
and I will let it warm up again. So what we're doing here is we are condensing the moisture out of the gas. In this case, we're using air, but in general, we will be condensing the moisture out of the gas, and that is how we will determine what the dew point is, because remember, the dew point is the temperature at which the moisture or water vapor condenses out of a liquid, in this case, a gas, at a specific pressure. So I'm just, just about finished here. Okay, the last drop was came off, and now my temperature is at 62 degrees. So we're averaging a dew point here around 60, 61 degrees. Let's do one more shot and see what we get. Okay, I'm just starting to see condensation again. The temperature is now 61 degrees. I'll wait for it to evaporate off of the internal mirror, and we will look at it again. Now, one thing I will say is if you have an idea of proximal, your dew point temperature is, you could open the CO2 valve and leave it open for more than a half a second. But again, don't overshoot your temperature. Okay, now the last drop is gone, and I have a temperature of 61 degrees. So I'm willing to say that at this temperature, at this pressure of about 70 PSI, the dew point of the water vapor in this air sample is about 61 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is just a generalized overview of how we use this particular piece of equipment. As you can tell, it is very portable. The heaviest thing here is this carbon dioxide tank. So you can put this in the back of your truck, go out to some remote field, tap into the natural gas pipeline and verify your dew point pressure. Well, thank you for watching this. Okay, now you could not actually see the condensation on the mirror just because of the way we had it set up in the lab. Very difficult to be able to see that. So I'm going to show you another video where we actually get to see the condensation temperature. Now you're going to be looking right in this area right here. Okay, this is about this distance here is about maybe one centimeter, maybe two centimeters, not very, not very big. Okay, so it's and, and if it covers this entire mirror, the internal mirror, you probably overshot the dew point. And like I said, it takes some time to get used to doing this so you can see what you're looking at. Now, the other thing is about this video I'm gonna show you, I did not monitor the temperature. I was just shooting this video so you could see what the condensation droplets look like on this internal mirror. So you will not hear me be looking at the temperature. I just have my, my camera pointed directly inside the chamber so you can see it. But you're gonna be focusing right about in this area right in here and you'll start to see it'll start in the center and it'll start to and then after a second or two it'll start to move out and then as it as it condenses down you'll see it shrink back in again okay see there it just started right right about in the lower part right here now i'm gonna let i've turned off the chilling and i'm letting the temperature warm back up again you can see the condensation starting to disappear. It shrinks down into it until it gets right about to this point here. Right about now, I would look at the temperature. Now I'm going to do it again. They just start to see a few droplets forming. So right now I will look at the temperature. Now again, just sort of as a review, what's happening here is we are taking water and we are dropping the temperature. Let me rephrase that. We're taking air. We are dropping the temperature of the air until the relative humidity is 100%, meaning that the water, the air, the air is completely saturated with water vapor and it cannot hold any more. And any excess water vapor is going to condense out. So that is pretty much what we're doing with this particular piece of equipment. Now, there are, there are some modern tools or modernizations of the Bureau of Mines dew point tester. Okay, obviously on the right here, on the left, we have the, the on the right is the Bureau of Mines tester. On the left is this Chanscope 2, both made by Chandler Engineering. 
Now they look exactly the same except for two things. The main point is they replace the thermometer here with this thermocouple, which goes inside this box. And so instead of having to go look at this mirror and then look at the temperature and look at this mirror and look at the temperature, you just look right in here and the temperature is displayed directly above the observation mirror. So you can basically just look inside the Chanscope 2 and then just lift your eyes up to see what temperature it is so you're not going back and forth. The other thing that's sort of nice about this is it has this eyepiece on here. So if you happen to be out with this bright sun, you saw how it was sort of difficult to see inside the pressure tight chamber when I was showing the video. You know, this, this shield blocks out light. So now you can clearly see the dew point temperature. You can clearly see the condensation on the mirror. And like before, this unit is portable too. I mean, there's a battery in here. So you could just put this whole thing in the back of your truck connect the thermocouple and turn the power on and you can you can check your temperature and check your dew point. So that's a little more of a modernization on this over here. The, the procedure is still exactly the same. It operates the same way. You still have to throttle your refrigerant and so on and so forth, but it all puts, all the, every, all the observation is done right here in this window. So what do you, you know, what, what's the point of knowing all this? Or you know what, what happens if I have my dew point, then what do I do? Okay, well, this is called a maqueta wehi chart, sometimes known as a dew point chart. And so basically, if you know your temperature, it can be dew point temperature, and you know what pressure you're operating at, okay, so let's say I'm here at just 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and I go up to this line, which is 200 PSI. Okay, I, this is a log chart, so I'm going over here, and I can see that my water content is about 30 pound mass per million standard cubic feet. Now that's what I need to know to, to design my dehydration system. So now I have an actual amount of water per volume that I can use to design my dehydration system. Now there are also other charts and tables that do this too. This is just one of the ones that's most widely known. All right, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about dehydration since we've been talking about dew point and, and why dehydration is important. And just, and this is not gonna be a presentation about dew point, I mean, about dehydration. I'm just gonna throw a few things out there for you. Obviously, there's three methods of dehydration that are primarily used. Number one is cooling, which is what the maqueta Wehi chart shows. If you, the, what, the ability of natural gas to contain water vapor decreases as temperature is lowered at a constant pressure. Okay, we can see that from the thing. Now, cooling is usually used with other dehydration processes because it's limited to the fact that even the gas is cooled, it's still at the dew point, unless you raise the temperature or lower the pressure. So cooling is a, a one possibility, but there are, it's usually used with one of these other two things. So now we're gonna talk about adsorption, which is a solid desiccant. And if you saw my, my, my lecture on the Ranorex, you noticed that solid desiccant is what we use to pull the humidity out of the air. So it's the same basic principle. Basically, it's the ability of a substance to hold gases or liquids on its surface. Now, the advantage with adsorption is you can remove almost all the water down to maybe say one ppm. Another method that's widely used is absorption, and that's used with a liquid desiccant, and water vapor is removed from the gas by direct contact with the liquid desiccant. Most of the time, we use glycols. So this is an example of what a adsorption or solid desiccant plant would look like here. So your wet gas is gonna come in from this location here and it has to go through this, this is a strainer, it cleans it, it's inlet separator, because you don't wanna have solids and liquids in there. Now, when I'm talking about wet gas with moisture, we are saying moisture is a gas at this point. Water vapor is a gas. Not a, we wanna pull liquid water out and everything else, but we're, the, we're not pulling the water out in this location. Now, we're going to run it through this first dehydrator, this section here. This is adsorbing. So the, the water is going to flow, with the gas rather, is going to flow down in this direction. As it flows down in this direction, the moisture, water vapor, is going to be removed from the gas. And it's going to go out to dry gas. <clears throat> now, this particular side over here, obviously, just like with the uh, solid desiccant in the Ranorex, we can regenerate this. So what we're doing is now we're driving it backwards here, we are regenerating this. We're driving the moisture back out of this side over here. So basically we use one side to dry our gas out while the other side is recharging or regenerating. Now this, this whole adsorption has some advantages. 
lower dew points are obtainable over a wide variety of conditions, which is a good thing. I, I mentioned before, we can buy very, very dry gas can be produced using this system. And the advantage is because nothing has to be maintained at any kind of temperature and there's not a lot of flowing. If you need to shut this down, for example, you can, you can restart it fairly quickly. Now, there are obviously there are dis disadvantages to the adsorption system as well. Obviously, the, the adsorbents will degenerate over time. They eventually wear out. You cannot use them forever. And just like your iPhone battery, the amount of times you have to keep cycling them back and forth, the less, less volume and less amount of water they're gonna be able to pull out over time. And then another big disadvantage is they have to be timed so that by the time this adsorbing material is completely saturated, this one is completely dry so you can switch over to it. And because we're using heat to drive the water off, this has to cool back down again too. So it, it's, a, it's quite a balancing act to be able to do that. So the other one is absorption, which is a liquid desiccant. And again, this is a glycol. Kind of the same process here. We put our wet gas through this scrubber and uh, we need to remove liquids, liquid water, liquid hydrocarbons from it. Now the gas is gonna flow in the upward direction while the glycol flows in the downward direction flows through a bunch of trays and then goes to these down combers. And as it goes through, it picks up the moisture from the gas. And then the dry gas that goes out through the top. Obviously the, the uh, glycol starts at the top and works its way down. So it has to end up being regenerated. And I'm not gonna go into detail about how all this works, but needless to say, this is when you get to this point over here, this is what removes the water out of the glycol. So you can cycle it, circle it, cycle, recirculate it again and make it usable another time here. Okay, I'm gonna change gears. I'm gonna switch over to gas chromatography. Now, gas chromatography has two main uses. One, we can determine the natural gas composition. And this is very detailed and very exact. And if, if you saw my Ranorex gravitometer lecture, we talked about if you know what the specific gravity is of methane, you can compare your gas sample to that of specific gravity methane and have a rough idea what the composition is. That's a very rough idea. You would not want to tell anyone you're buying or selling gas from, I'm going to go with this number. But most importantly is we can also determine BTU analysis and custody transfer. That means buying and selling of natural gas is usually in BTU per cubic foot. So we can determine the BTU analysis of a gas sample, but we also have to have some kind of a measuring device so we can get the volume of it. Okay, so that's very important to, to know. <clears throat> All right. Now this is a chart that has a typical component range of natural gases. You know, one thing I'm gonna bring to your attention over here, you can see obviously methane is down here zero, zero to 100%. Obviously, most of our gas is going to be in this range here. This very top component is called C6 plus, and that's called he hexanes and heavier. So heptane, octane, nonane, those are all C6 plus. And if you'll notice, that represents 0.07% or less. So rather than separate out each one of those components individually, they're all separated out together as what's called C6 plus. So a machine, a, a chromatograph that operates and takes out all the C6 plus gases together is called a C6 plus test or C6 plus application, which is what I'm gonna be talking about some today. Now the gas chromatograph is actually an, in an oven to maintain the temperature. Now the three main purposes you can see off to the side of what the gas chromatograph, what the oven does is injection, separation and detection, which I'm gonna go through those <clears throat> excuse me, in a little bit here, how we're going to do this. So we're going to use it, well, for starters, our sample goes in here. So this is, that's the injection part right here. We have three valves in the chromatograph. And yes, I have another, I have good animation for this. It'll explain this a lot better than me just pointing at it. So you'll be able to see what we're doing, but just, I'm just going to go over what some of these components are. This is our sampling valve. This is our back flush valve. And this is our dual column valve. <clears throat> now we heat this oven to a constant temperature of about 80 degrees Celsius. And I mentioned the sample is gonna be transported through the chromatograph in this location here by a carrier gas, which we use helium because it's chemically inert. 
And the carrier gas, all, not only does that trans, transport the gas sample through the chromatograph, it also transfers or transports the individual molecules. So once we break it down. Now you will notice here that there are two detectors here. There's a measuring detector and a reference detector. The carrier gas goes in by itself through the reference detector. That's how we can determine what each of the components means. Because remember, the carrier gas is going through the entire system with the molecules. So the reference detector measures the thermal conductivity of the helium. That way, when the helium and the individual components come through the measurement detector, they can take out the helium part so we know what it actually is set up. Now, the separation actually occurs in these columns here, these three columns, okay? So what happens? What do these columns look like? All right. These columns are made of stainless steel usually. They're between one and 10 meters long. And the internal diameter is about four millimeters. Now, obviously, if they were a straight, a straight tubing, it'd be a very long machine. So they're usually coiled. That's why they look like this here. They're coiled, but they're still very small. Okay. <clears throat> The optimal column temperature depends on the boiling point of the sample. So we try and keep the, the heater about 80 degrees Celsius. So we're just above the average boiling point of the sample. And that, that allows us to keep the elution time. Elution is the amount of time it takes to run through the chromatograph and then exit the other side between two and 30 minutes. <clears throat> so what this material that's inside over here, this packing material and the column itself is called the stationary phase because it does not move during the process. And then obviously the carrier gas and the molecules are called the moving phase. So we kind of, it would make some sense there. So as the gas moves through one of these columns, the components with the lower boiling points move more slowly than the components with higher boiling points. And the speed at which the separation occurs is dependent on the temperature of the column. Now the length of the column determines the amount of the separation. So conceivably, we could use a single column to separate all components, but that would be very long, which is why we have the three columns. So for an example here, this column number one here, this column one pulls out the C6 and heavier components in column one. Column two is the pentanes and the normal butane. And column three is nitrogen, methane, carbon dioxide, and ethane. Now the time it takes for a particular compound to travel through the column is dependent on the boiling point of the compound and the temperature of the column. I briefly alluded to that before. If you run through, you run a sample through at high temperature and high flow rates, it decreases the retention time, which means it passes through faster. However, it also decreases the quality of the separation. You may get, instead of having individual molecules with this kind of spacing, you may get Say for example, you may get one of these yellow ones back here with the green one. So you're not, when you measure this, you're gonna measure these three as opposed to just those two, okay? So the longer column time improves the separation, but then you get what's called peak broadening. So, and I'll go into that too here in a little bit. Now, like I said, I do have a video I wanna show you about how these work, so you'll have a rough idea here. And I'm gonna, so you watch this and I'll, this video does not have any talking in it. You will hear the valve switch over, but I will do some narration and there is a description at the bottom. <clears throat> So now we're just purging the system here. Okay, now the sample's going through and it, you see that this valve just switched over and now it contains it inside the chromatograph. It's not gonna go out, exit the chromatograph. And remember that the helium is what's taking this all the way through the system over here. Now, like I said, you see how the green split off? That's the C6 plus while the, the lighter sections, which is everything else, is gonna go on to the next one here. Now the back flush valve just closed, which now kept these components in this, in this section here. Now you'll notice, now the, C, now the C6 plus is starting to go back through the chromatic, chromatograph so we can exit out the measurement detector. Now the lightest elements are now closed in column three, 
while the midweight elements are, are eluding through, of course, separating in column two. Now what you're seeing down here, these are the peaks. So these peaks are gonna be somewhat re related to our composition. Now, basically, all the lightweight components are starting to separate in this column number three here. And they all have to go back through the measurement detector. So, yes, it looks like they're taking a long time to make it through there. And again, the speed that they're moving is dependent on the individual compound as it passes through the column packing material. So that's just a general overview of how it works. <clears throat> now let me show you what the chromatogram actually looks like. I'm gonna show you a detailed drawing of what these peaks would look like. So here's an example of a chromatogram that we ran several years ago. Now, the one thing I wanna call your attention to is these numbers up here, these are not the value of the peak, the height of the peak, this is actually the time. So if you look at 85.7, that comes down to 85.7 seconds. That's when that actually came out of the chromatograph or past the detector. Now, before we can actually calculate the concentration, this thing needs to be calibrated to determine the response factors for each of the individual components. So we use calibrated gas samples to determine that. Now the response factor, which is the calibration factor, is used in combination with this peak height and these peak areas to determine the actual composition. And here's an example of what a composition analysis report would look like. Now you'll notice here, I want, first thing I wanna call your attention is notice that this nitrogen is 67.8 parts per million. Okay, that's, even though the top of this column says mole percent, this is parts per million. So don't think of the 67% nitrogen, that would be air. But notice we have a very high percentage of ethane in this, in this sample and then propane. So we have two fairly good gases in here, not much methane though, methane is fairly low. So this is more of a wetter gas, okay? Now I mentioned about, we can do BTUs, and we can determine relative density, specific gravity indirectly. So here's our BTU value here. So we basically have a BTU value of 1,824.37 BTUs. Now you remember I said that we sell gas, we buy gas, custody transfers occur on BTU per cubic foot. So we need to have a certain volume of gas to determine what the actual BTU value of that gas is. This is just the BTU number of this particular sample. And finally, I talked about relative density. Okay, we can see, and obviously we know having ethane and propane, this gas has a, a density of 1.18, so it's heavier than air. So it has a specific gravity higher than 1.18 as well, because we know that it's heavier than air. So that's, you know, we, we can get that information based on the chromatograph, using a gas chromatograph. And this is the way that it's done a lot of times a lot of times at custody transfer points, you will see the gas chromatograph is there so that whether you're buying or selling gas, you're getting what you're paying for or you're getting paid for what you're selling. So are there any questions? Thank you, Professor Chris, for this informative webinar. I'm sure we all benefit greatly from it. And um, there's some questions here. 
Which gas component is majorly used in gas chromatography? Which which gas component? Yeah, is majorly used yeah. in well, gas chromatography. If I understand the question correctly, the gas chrom chromatograph will take a gas sample and determine the components. So if you if you're if you're in the natural gas industry, it's probably calibrated to identify the wet gas samples, like I said, if you look at this over here, we can, this particular one will, will identify these two butanes, pent, these three pentanes, nitrogen. It won't go into, you need to have a, a chromatograph that is designed for the sample that you want to measure. So if, if your gas does not have these types of items, you probably are not going to be able to sample that. But it's designed to pick up these types of materials. I think, that, I hope that answers the question. Uh, and the second question, what is hydrate model? And can you give brief information about it? What is hydrate model? Yes. Okay, I'm not sure that I understand that question. I'll go back to the mm -hmm. hydrate here for a second there. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question about what a hydrate model is. So for the next question, what is the main role of reference detector in chrom chromatography? Chr chromatograph? Okay. What's the main role of the reference detector in the chromatograph? It's a good question. So if we look at the, the actual diagram of the chromatograph here, what we will see is the reference detector has to measure the carrier gas, in this case, helium. Because if we do not know what the characteristics of helium are, and we're using helium, remember, we're using helium to transport our gas sample through the chromatograph. Helium is always flowing through the chromatograph. If we have not isolated the signature of the helium, we are gonna continuously measure helium on this side, and we're not going to know what the components are. So for example, if we look at it this way, the reference detector measures helium. When we have our samples coming out, the individual components coming out the measurement detector, we're going to have helium and nitrogen, helium and methane, helium and pentane, <coughs> helium and butane. We need to subtract the helium from whatever that other component is, be it ethane or propane or methane, so we know what it is. So if we, don't, if we don't have some kind of a signature over here, we won't be able to subtract it over here from the measuring detector. Okay, and the last question, um, which pressure for hydrocarbon and water for measuring dew point temperature uh, of condensation? What's the pressure and temperature for measuring the dew point of water for Condensation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think what they're asking, I think you're asking about this graph right over here. Could you repeat the question again? So I'm uh, looking at this graph. Okay. Um, at which pressure for hydrocarbon and water for measuring dew point temperature of condensation? Oh, which, okay. Which pressure? So you're looking at what, what pressure am I going to measure this at? Well, now that depends. You need to make sure that you're measuring the pressure for the hydrocarbons at whatever pressure you're going to be operating your pipelines at. So you do not want to measure the pressure. For example, when we did it, we did it in the lab. We just measured it at 100 PSI. But if you're going to be, if you want to know what the dew point is of gas in your pipeline, and you're running the pipeline at say 20 PSI or 500 PSI, you want to make sure that you're measuring the dew point at that temperature and pressure. If you're running it at 500 PSI, you should measure it at 500 PSI. That way you're actually determining what the dew point is at that pressure. So if I look at this chart over here, let's just say I'm running at 200 PSI, which is this line right here. It, if the amount of water that is in the gas sample, for example, can be, if I'm at this temperature here, which is about 105 degrees roughly, Fahrenheit, it looks like I'm at 300 or so pounds, but if I'm at the 200, if I'm down here somewhere and I'm at running at 60, now my, my, uh, I have 50 pounds 
of water per million standard cubic feet. So you want to make sure that you're doing your tests at the proper temperature and pressure that you're going to be using them in the pipelines. Okay. Uh, Professor Chris, there is another question here. Why we, why we use carbon dioxide in dew point tester? Okay, we use, we use carbon dioxide because it is fairly inexpensive. It is generally environmentally friendly. And because like I mentioned, once you, when it expands, when liquid carbon dioxide expands and turns into a gas, it can cool something down very quickly. So it doesn't take a long time to cool down that chamber. And by doing it with the throttling where you open it for a half a second, then you can, you can get a fast temperature change, but not so fast that you overshoot the, the dew point temperature. So it's, it's economical, it's cheap, it's easy to come by. It doesn't have any transportation issues. It's just a good way to do it. Uh, the last question, does chromatography analysis help us determine the liquid vapor equilibrium, especially for the design of separators? The chromatograph will only determine gaseous sample materials. So you should be putting, you should put dehydrated gas through the chromatograph. It will not give you any kind of liquids in there at all. It's not designed for that. It's only designed to measure the, the compounds that are listed here. So basically, like I said, propane, isobutanes, pentane, nitrogen, methane, carbon dioxide, ethane. It will not, it will not identify water, water content of a gas. Thank you so much, Professor Chris, again, for your effort in this terrific webinar. And now, uh, to highlight, this session ha has been recorded and will be uploaded soon on Pi Petro YouTube channel. So kindly make sure to subscribe on our channel. Wishing you a great day. Stay safe and bye.